Welcome back, gentlemen and lady. If there's any ladies that listen to this. Guys, we actually I take that back. There is some. And I do appreciate your lady support. So today we got a special guest with us. Uh, Thomas is probably going to jump in and out. I don't know what's going on. He's on a phone call. But Travis is here with me for those of you guys listening on, on the audio podcast. And today we have Joel Strickland from Surviving Duck Season on with us today. How are you doing, Joel? I'm doing great. Good, good. I'm glad I caught you today. It was kind of a last minute text, but I'm glad we get you on here. We've been talking about it for a little bit. Yeah, I'm just like right in the middle of being busy, and then today I had a catch-up day, and then tomorrow I'm traveling, so it kind of worked out perfect. Awesome. So, well, I don't want to jump ahead of myself because I got something I want to say that I think is pretty funny, but why don't you tell (laughs) us a little bit about yourself and uh, your channel. You have a great channel, incredible editing that. I don't know if I'll ever reach that level, but... Yeah, just super professional. Uh, if you guys haven't already, check out Surviving Duck Season on YouTube. He has great hunts, and he's a great guy. And I uh, would like to just get keep getting better acquainted with him. And uh, just kind of tell us about yourself a little bit, Joel, and your background and stuff. Sure. Well, I, I uh, started duck hunting when I was about 15 years old, and uh, um I got bit very hard by the duck hunting bug the very first time I went out. And little did I know at that point of my young life how much of an impact that that would make to everything that I do. And uh, it, it's uh, it's caused me to make, you know, so many of my life decisions the duck hunting has. I mean, because I'm obsessed with it. Like mm-hmm. so many uh, of our listeners are, are, are as a, you know, as well. Uh, I uh, started working in, in film and television production when I was still in high school because that was something that I was very interested in. I love photography and all that and got introduced into filmmaking. And, you know, ever since then, uh, I've always tried to figure out how I could put hunting especially duck hunting and filmmaking together. Mm -hmm. And so off and on throughout the last 30 years, I've worked in mainstream film and television, but then I've also worked in some outdoor television and, and that sort of thing. And, and then just a few years ago, I I decided I, I wanted to, uh, you know, try my hand at doing my own thing. And I actually considered doing outdoor television, but it just didn't seem feasible at all. I'd been working in that for a long time and decided that I feel like I can make a go at this YouTube thing. And so I started researching, you know, uh, you know how you, because YouTube is completely different than television. Mm -hmm. And, and so I just, it's nothing like I thought it would be. It's like so much better than I thought it would be. It's Mm -hmm. an, it's an incredible experience uh, because, you know, television, we, we create content that we just basically push it to people and say, here it is. Hope you like it, you know, Mm -hmm. and YouTube is, it's like an interactive kind of thing, you Mm -hmm. know, Mm -hmm. and that's what is, I just didn't, I didn't realize how cool that would be that, that I just love that part of it. Yeah. You said something, something real, go ahead, Travis. Hey, I was going to say something, you know, it sounds like to me that you got a classic case of duck itis um, (laughs) and have you found a cure for that yet? Uh, the only thing that cures is just going. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but you know what? It seems like that just kind of like uh, gets it worse. It seems like you'd be taking a medication that doesn't cure the problem. It yeah. just masks it for a little <laughs> while, and then it flares back up. You know, so mm-hmm. I, I think that that's something that uh, all of us duck hunters have. And I think that you know, if you get out there and and get in the marsh, it, it's highly contagious. Like you said, mm. yeah, it is. <laughs> I mean, it's it's like I mean, I, I could be you know in high school. You know, I can remember like sitting in class and like daydreaming, mm-hmm. just thinking about duck hunting like in May. <laughs> you know, it's like what? You know, and and I mean, embarrassed to say, but I can remember like many days, just you know, when I was especially when I was younger, just sitting in church, you know, and I'm be I'd be thinking, I wonder, if, I wonder if that speaker up there, how far that speaker is. I think that's about twenty five yards. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. I, I, I've done that, man. I've done that. Oh no, the poor pastors other don't even know he's thinking about getting shot. Up. <laughs> you just see a green head. I'm like, you see his green and yellow. On it. <laughs> I was, I always wondered why they they i was trying to find i want to find out the person i don't know you know that made summer vacation 
in the summer. I'm like, uh, they they weren't a duck hunter because yeah. if you give kids three months off, it should have been in duck season. You know, I'm like, who was this person? Yeah, yeah. Right. You know, the, the, the thing about that, you know, and I've, I've had this conversation off and on for years, but it's just like, it's, we're, we're in it again. We're in September and I have always thought of September as the beginning of the year. You know, when you get to Labor Day, <laughs> it's like, this is the start of it. Cause you know, I'm thinking, okay, we got does, we got yes. teal and early goose and blah, blah, blah. And if I travel to, you know, whatever Canada or something like that, you know, it's just like, in September, and then when we get to, you know, February, we pretty much is over with at the end of January. Oh, you're and then cut, it's just like you're cutting out a little bit. No, I moved the phone. Can you can you hear me now? There we yes. go. There we go. No, okay. Yeah. So I mean, I was just saying, you know, but the end of, by the end of the season, you know, in January, into January, into February, a little bit. I mean, it's just kind of over with. And to me, it's like. Uh, the, the year is over with. Yeah, <laughs> life, <laughs> life is over with. <laughs> <laughs> My wife always says I go into depression for about a month after duck season ends. It does. I, I, it, it's so true. I mean, and it's like, and to me, you know, I'm, I'm a duck hunting guide in Arkansas, and we we go every single day of the season. And the last week, it's like I'm I'm kind of ready for it to be over with because I'm so exhausted. But at the same time, I don't want it to be over with. And, and then that last day, it's just, it's just a very, you, you know, you know, you understand. Cause y'all oh, yeah. do, yes. do it too. It's like, you have that feeling and just like in your gut. And yes. then the next day you wake up and you're like so depressed and you're like, okay, <laughs> I, I don't mind having a day or two of rest, but I really like to start it up again. You know? <laughs> right. Well, yeah. And you know, you're, <laughs> Like you said, you're like, okay, I got to take a break. And then by the time you wake up the next morning, you're ready to go again. You know, it's like, it's, uh, you know, because you get so used to looking forward at the end of one hunt, looking forward to the next one. And then when it's over, you don't have nothing. It's like, you don't have nothing to look forward to, you know, like, <laughs> I mean, you know, there's birthdays and stuff like that, but man, come on, you know? Yeah. There's no I, mean, work turkey, on Monday. I, yeah. I love turkey hunting, but man, I tell you what, it's just, it's just not the same. It's not. <laughs> I'm close. I am close. It just kind of helps uh, ease the pain a little bit. So right. how right long on. have you been, uh, what's the outfit that you guide for? A Cypress Crossing Duck Club in uh, just outside Stuttgart. And uh, I've been with, this will be, I guess, my 10th duck season uh, with them. And uh, uh, the oh. guy that, that owns it, Scott Kerr, is a friend of mine. I met him probably a year or so before that. And he had really, he'd been, he'd been a duck guide off and on over the years. I had too, you know, it's just, I just kind of like had some leases and took some guys and I had friends that were doctors and they had doctor friends that need, that wanted to go and that kind of thing. But as far as like, you know, hunting at a lodge and guiding at a lodge, just that was my first experience and kind of doing that whole thing. And it's a, it's a very, it's a very cool experience. I we, we meet so many neat people from all over the world that come to Arkansas, you know, for their bucket list hunt. Mm -hmm. Now, do you do more rice hunts or more timber hunts? We, we do a little bit of everything. We have flooded timber. We have a bunch of rice fields. We also have a lot of moist soil habitat. Really, moist soil habitat is probably about my favorite. I mean, I love flooded timber. Don't get me wrong, but, you know, it's, it's, there's a, it's, Moist soil habitat, at least a lot of the kind that we have, there's there's a lot of standing cover. And so, you know, you kind of get the ducks to work in close and tight, mm -hmm. um, similar to what you do in the timber, except you can see them coming a lot further away mm -hmm. and you have a lot more of a variety of birds too. So we get our mallards, but then we'll get, you know, pintails and teal and gadwalls and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. I mean, but yeah, I mean, it's kind of an even mixture. You know, we, we usually, we have three but either three or four groups that hunt every day and we probably hunt the timber. Um, it really, we like to save the timber for when we know it's going to be good and it's really needs to be a, a sunny day for it to really be right. Mm. Uh, we don't always honor that because sometimes you just get into these six or seven or eight days in a row where it's cloudy. But, uh, but you know, we, we hunt the timber, you know, probably about, about every other day, maybe, you know, as long as it's sunny. And then we have, uh, you know, more soil habitat is, is a, is a lot of what we hunt. And then of course we have the agricultural fields, rice and soybeans and a little bit of corn. Hmm. Now, are you saying, I'm not sure what you're saying. Are you saying moist full? 
or moist, moist, moist soil. Oh, moist, moist soil. soil. Okay, I okay. thought that yeah. for a second, <laughs> but then it was so yeah. it was blended. I was like, okay, yeah, moist soil. So what? <laughs> I mean, what do you really mean when you're saying mo moist soil? Like, yeah. So what kind of? What does it look like? Yeah, moist soil habitat is what is native grasses that grow. Mm in a seasonally flooded environment, mm. okay? And so what we're talking about is uh, millets and oh. different types of sedges and, um, you know, smart weed and gotcha. tooth cup and, and, you know, spangle top. And, I mean, there's, like, all kinds mm. of those types of habitat. And, and so what happens is it, it floods, you know, either – because man, you know, because man does it, because we've got to love it up or whatever, or if it's in a, a completely natural environment, it'll usually flood from about the 1st of December all the way through about May. And then it starts drying up as it, as it gets hot in the summertime. Mm. And then by the, by the time we get to, you know, the middle to latter part of July, it's completely bone dry. And then, you know, it's when it starts growing, you know, growing back. And then, you know, then we, it starts all over again. Mm. I heard something. Um, now this is this was a shock to me, and this is probably six months ago. I thought flooded timber because I have an infatuation right with it because I just something I have never done and I've always mm -hmm. wanted to do. And that's some of the craziest videos that I've seen is just people in the timber. It's just probably because I'm not there. I mean, I'm sure it's awesome. It's just I haven't done it, so it's even more of something you really want to do and it infatuates you. Mm -hmm. But I seen. Um, uh, a picture of a timber place during season that was flooded, and I thought that's what it looked like year round. Because then I seen they someone had put a side by side said this is what it looks like in the off season. I was blown away because I was like, what? I thought that was always flooded. I thought that's just how it always looked. Now, so so when we talk about Arkansas timber hunting, you know, and that's I mean to me that's the that's the standard, I guess, for timber hunting. A lot of people call a lot of things timber mm -hmm. that I don't consider timber. Mm -hmm. um, so when we talk about flooded timber that you that you hunt when you come to Arkansas, it's green timber. Green meaning it's live trees. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're it's you know we have generally the the eastern half of the state is fairly flat, and so it's it's you know pin oak flats and and other types of oak trees that are off of the off the rivers or they may be man-made impoundments that were created, you know, a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of them were created in the thirties and forties and fifties. And, uh, and then of course we have a lot of public hunting, um, in Arkansas that's timber. I mean, it's just, it's an unbelievable amount. I mean, one, we have got one, uh, uh, management area that's got about 35,000 acres and and then there's several more that are way over 10,000 acres that just is flooded timber and it's all uh, you know they've got levees and controlled structures in them to hold water uh, but it's it's you know basically based on rainwater I mean you, if you can imagine you're not going to pump 40,000 yeah. acres or so, right. <laughs> you know right but yeah so so it's it uh we you have to you have to drain the water or it'll kill the trees and then oh. you've got a dead a dead timber reservoir which is a completely different thing so we're standing next to mm. live oak trees that are in their dormant winter you know phase and uh, and then you know there's mass crop of acorns and all kinds of other you know things that grow in the in the forest that you know that the ducks will eat um, I, I I think that there's equal uh, amount of just loafing that what the what the ducks do the mallards do um, in the timber they just come in there and they get in the shade on a sunny day and, and just kind of chill out but they do eat you know they do eat the uh, the food in there too hmm. that's uh, and I think I remember hearing I think the person that posted this picture was the same one that said about it and I never thought about that because obviously the water would kill the trees so it kind of threw me mm -hmm. off, but I never thought about dead timber. So your idea of flooded timber is timber that the trees are still alive; they're just in their dormant stage. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's 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 that, that's what you know green timber hunting is. And again, it's also you know the the big oak trees, you know the you know great big tall stands of trees that are mature, you know sixty eighty year old you know hardwood timber. So uh, do they? How long can those trees last? Is it like two months that they're flooded or three months or like how long is that? 
it really depends because some of the, you know, some of the places where it's like off of the different river systems, I mean, they may flood out in November or December and not even come back in their banks until, I mean, May or June. I mean, it happens, oh. and that's not, it's not good for the trees. I mean, really, the, the biologists tell us that they would prefer them to be, you know, two to three months uh, really from, you know, from about the middle of November until the 1st of February is about all they really want them to be flooded, but that doesn't always happen. And, and then, you know, we can here here's something that, that can be a, a whole podcast on, but I'll just throw this out there. You know, uh, um, Arkansas has been dealing with those very issues in the last several years about a lot of the habitat just dying because too much, um, you know, too long a period of time of flooding has happened on the trees. There's a lot of the different management areas that are now closing part of their areas to duck hunting at certain years. And, mm. you know, they're going to be not allowing the flooding because, you know, they, they'll keep the water control structures open so that they won't flood and that sort of thing because they're afraid that all the trees are going to, I mean, they're starting to die anyway, and they're afraid that they're going to lose the lose the forest and so it's uh it's not a fun fun topic to discuss with duck hunters because they they don't like the idea of not getting to go hunting but it's a it's a long term you know thing that we you know you can't just grow an oak tree in three years right (laughs) takes years yeah man yeah that i i I think i heard a podcast about that and even me i felt bad for the you guys so uh as far as rain, like how much rain, how many inches of rain are you guys getting in, like, say, during duck season only? Mm, I haven't really looked. I think I think we get about 50-something inches a year. We get quite a bit of rain. Oh, a year, okay. Yeah, but as far as during duck season, I mean, gosh, I don't, I don't even, I don't even know. We get, we get plenty. I mean, we get, we get a lot, you know, most years, um, uh, you know, there's when I used to hunt public areas or, or I relied on the river systems, I always wanted it to rain all the time. Uh, now that I hunt mostly private ground and we can control our water, I prefer it to be dry because that concentrates the birds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You switched over. across. The- <laughs> <laughs> so how often as a guide, Joel, do you get to get out and hunt yourself? I mean, do you just pick up a gun every once in a while when you're with clients and they're limited out or do you, Try to make some time to go out by yourself. You know, I I don't get to go off on my own per se during the Arkansas season very much. Um, there'll be occasions that um, we may have a, a buddy hunt that we do with the other guides when we don't have, you know, all the, you know, we don't we're not a full lodge or like the first week of duck season. Sometimes we don't we don't typically book up every single day of the first week just because it can be hit or miss um, depending upon the weather. It's because it's kind of early. And so, you know, those are days that we might, you know, get to go hunting a little bit on our own. But I'll be honest with you, I mean, I've hunted 30, you know, whatever, 35 years, and I have killed a lot of ducks, and I am so excited to take other people and let them shoot and watch them shoot. And it, it's just, I mean – that may sound crazy, but I just, I, I really enjoy it. And so I don't feel like I miss anything. I get that question a lot. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, a lot of the guys that come hunt with me, they say, do you ever get to hunt? I said, I'm hunting right now, man. I'm yeah. having a ball. I'm calling, I'm working my dog and mm-hmm. you know, that, well, that makes me, it even more whole, fun. Cause you have a dog yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, you know, do I pick up my gun? Yes. I mean, I, I carry my gun every day. I shoot a little bit most days. Um, I'm not, you know, it's mainly clean up. If I see somebody shoot a duck and I don't think it's going to get finished off, I'll, I'll knock it down and, and that kind of thing and, and whatnot. But, you know, typically unless it's, you know, just a barn burner morning, I'm probably not going to get in there and kill my limit. I typically don't anyway. I just, I might just shoot one or two birds. Yeah. And I could totally see how that would be <laughs> fine. If you're doing that every day for a living, you know, it's like, well, whatever. You know, yeah. I'll shoot a couple birds. I mean, what's what's the point for you to go out there and do that, you know? Yeah. Yes, really. But so what do you got in store this year for your channel? How You put out some great content. I'm trying to stall for something you sent me for Thomas to get back in here. I just don't know if it's going to happen or not. <laughs> I don't want to jump on that topic without him, but I thought I was rolling. Yeah. We'll hold that for a second. But so, yeah. I mean, you you really... I mean, when did you post your first video? Wasn't it even a year ago? Yeah, it was a 
May of last year. So whatever. You're, you're killing it. Like, are you months. like tw- about 12,000 subs right now? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Or more, something like that. Yeah, right. I think it's just right at twelve thousand. Yeah. Just remember me when you pass this up. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> it, you know it. It's uh, it, it that that whole thing is blowing my mind too. Because I, you know, when you first get into it, it's you, you have no idea how it's really going to work. Uh-huh. And you get, I mean, I the first couple of videos that I put out were like, I mean, I spent more time on each of the first three videos than I did on like full length television shows and stuff. I mean, I had like a hundred hours in the edit wow. on some of the, on those videos and, and a lot of time. I mean, we traveled all over the place. There's a lot of money in it. I mean, mm-hmm. it was like, this is big time. And then, and then I posted the videos and they're like, got nothing just sat there. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's not a good thing. <laughs> you know, yeah. And, 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 and as, as time goes on and you kind of start figuring some things out and, and, and whatnot, you know, it gets, it, um, you know, you understand a little bit better and, and I've changed kind of the, the, uh, the way that I do content and I'm going to pick that up again, some of that type of content again, when I, when I have the, the viewership to support it. Um, but you know, you know, to answer your question, uh, I've got, a lot of different types of content that, that we're going to be doing over the next couple of months before we get going wide open on our duck season here in Arkansas. But um, I've got several uh, kind of documentary style uh, videos where I'm going to be highlighting uh, some people that took their waterfowl obsession to the next level. And uh, just like I have, just like y'all have, you know, I mean, whether it's somebody that, that decided they wanted to be a guide or somebody that wanted to create a product, um, you know, making their own decoys or, mm-hmm. or duck calls or having a YouTube channel. or I mean, there's just so many different things that we do so that it doesn't have to just be those 60 or 120 days or whatever, your, however many days of your right. season it is. You can extend that season when you do, you know, something else and you take it to the next level. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that's a, it's it's a we're doing. I mean, I started out doing it just for a memory, you know, like to save the memory, and it's a good place to put up where everybody can access it. And mm-hmm. then it just kind of take took off. So I really didn't have an intention when I originally started. And then me being the kind of competitive guy I am, you know, it's like okay, now that I'm doing this and I'm putting a lot into it and time and money and cameras and traveling. Which is perfect because I already love duck hunting anyway, so it's it's not no sweat off my teeth. But then you're you're expecting things, you know, you're expecting performance, and there's highs and lows, and you're like get frustrated, then get pumped up, and you're just like, oh, this thing's, you know, I'm just analyzing every day. What can I do to get better? What can I? How can I make this better? You know, things are changing so much. Um, Travis's brother-in-law uh, used to be with Midwest Whitetail. I think he's still prize associated with them. I, um, with uh, Winky and all those guys over there, and yeah. he's he's done a channel, and he has incredible footage, but because it's not current and it's not more, uh, what's the right word I'm looking for, like in the now more so, it just doesn't get the traction because his stuff blows mine away or a lot of YouTubers, you know? Yeah, it's, it's more for like mm. that, the format of... For the TV. TV, yeah. yeah. And it but, seems like that with YouTube, people want to get in there and they want to watch something that's really quick and... I don't know what it is about YouTube, but people are attracted to it. You know, I think mm. even more than sitting there and watching a whole TV program interrupted by commercials. That Which sort of they thing. have that now on YouTube. They have that with YouTube, but they're not as long. Yeah. You know, you can skip them. Yeah, right. <laughs> true, true. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that the YouTube format for now is is the way of the future. You know, everything changes over time. But it seems like yeah. YouTube is... Well, when, when I was making my decision on what I wanted to do with my content... You know, because I've got I've got like so much stuff. I mean, you know, we've uh, I've shot video of hunting since the early 90s on like professional, you know, broadcast cameras and cinematic cameras and all that kind of stuff. And so, uh, you know, I've, I've I got to a point, you know, um, I don't remember when it was sometime last year in the summertime, somebody recognized 
me because they I used to have a television show. And so they, they recognized me and say, hey, you ought to put up some of that footage from when you did the blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I never thought of that. Okay. And I did. And then it kind of took off. And so it's it's all about how you package it because, mm-hmm. you know, it, it was all shot, you know, like in the 90s and early 2000s when it was, you know, standard definition. But it still looks really good. And so it's like it's it's interesting to people and especially some of the younger guys that, you know, they, they hear what, what it used to be like a long time ago and they would be neat to see it. So, you know, bringing that out, I mean, I've got some really, really cool things. Like, I mean, the very first duck hunt that I ever went on with a spinning wing decoy, I've got it on video and it was the most amazing thing ever. I mean, it was so cool, you know, back in like 96 and uh, you know, that's kind of stuff that, you know, it's like, man, I I forgot I had that. Mm. Have you have you posted that one? Yeah, I did. I think actually. I remember that because I because it sounds so familiar, and I'm like, you know what? You're the only one I know would have would have put that up. And I I I have heard other hunters. Obviously, they don't film. They said that was the most amazing season, one of the most amazing seasons they had because that was a new deal, and it was just like fire. I guess it it was like um, we would say that that i mean there's a lot of guys that never shot ducks i mean you'd you'd know oh so and so he never kills ducks and then all of a sudden he'd be he'd be bringing in a whole strap of ducks you know to the duck picker or something it's like what did you do and you come to find out that they're using the spinners too i mean you can take them and put them anywhere i mean we, we would joke around saying oh yeah you could take one of those and and jab it in the ground in a puddle in the walmart parking lot in stuttgart and you can kill a limit of ducks <laughs> wow they worked that good then huh it was, I mean, you could stand out in the decoys doing jumping jacks and they would come in and land. I mean, you could be out walking around in the decoys. Oh. I mean, and sometimes that happens anyway, but I mean, I'm talking like full sun in the middle of the morning, like 10 o'clock. I mean, their ducks would be like landing next to you if you're out in the decoys. Wow. And it, it lasted yeah. like that for maybe, I don't know, maybe like three years. I mean, the, the, the when I first started using those, it was before the craze. It was like the year before everybody caught on to them. So I got like a, a pre, a pre year of hunting with them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I, I looked at my buddy that was with me the first morning when we used them. And I told him, I said, we can't tell anybody about this. <laughs> <laughs> All duck hunters are the same. Stingy guts, man. <laughs> we found the secret. We've all, I think we've all said that at one point in time in our <laughs> duck hunting careers. <laughs> uh, that's so funny. So what's your thoughts on spinning wings now? You know, they, they, they don't work the same as they used to. I think everybody would agree, but, we still use them a lot and, and I, you know, we'll, we'll talk about them a little bit on some of our videos and I'll get comments from, um, guys saying, Oh, they don't work. They don't work. And I'm like, I'm hunting in probably the most heavily pressured area in the world. And we use them regularly and we shoot ducks with them, (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know? And so they work, but, but, but I guess, you know, the thing about it is, and, and I have to always remember, you know, and I think we all should remember that, you know, just because you see somebody else do something on a video doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for you right. where you're hunting. And because duck hunting is so different everywhere. Right. I don't care if you have a lot of ducks or, or a few ducks. It just thing, things work different in different places. And and the reason why I hunt the way I do, the, I'm very aggressive with my calling. I'm very loud and obnoxious a lot of the time. I can do that because my the what, what I'm what I'm doing is I'm basically you know, if you want to equate it to fishing, I'm trolling, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm calling and calling, calling, something's going to pay attention to me, you know, rather than being the conservative and just, you know, kind of, you know, just trying a little bit of calling or something. It's the same thing with, with those spinning wing decoys, you know, we've got, we've always got lots and lots of ducks in the air all morning. And so those spinners, will attract their will attract those ducks from a long way away. Mm-hmm. Does it attract all of them? No. But I've got so many birds in the air that my odds are really high that I'm gonna get some of those, you know, ducks that we can fool with them and and you know, they don't they don't work the same. You can't come call them all the way into the water with them. Uh, you know, you you need to have them on a remote so that you can turn them off when they get, you know, 70, 80 yards away yeah. or, or whatever. Okay. And 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 then 
I, we use those flock of flickers, you know, that Mojo makes and those things are great. They're on little timers and they're a lot smaller and you put four or five of those out and they, they spread out and those work really well. In fact, I probably use those almost every day. There's some days I'll pull the, the regular spinners up cause they, they just, you know, and cloudy days, they just, I don't, I don't have much luck with them on cloudy days anyway. I agree. I feel the same way about them. And like you said, they work different in different situations and environments, you know, like um, our refuges. Uh, have you have you done much hunting out here in California, Joel? I haven't done any waterfowl hunting in California. Okay. I, well, I feel like on our refuge system, this doesn't apply everywhere. Again, different places, different things. But a lot of our, our public refuges, there's guys so tight. And they're all visual, if that makes sense. Like if the like if you go up, because I fly helicopters, right? So I see mm-hmm. what the birds see from above. And if yeah. you're flying above and say you're up 100 yards, uh, 200 yards, 300 yards, and you look down and you see 10 ponds all with that same thing in it, I'm just thinking, not that I can think like a duck, but my brain's a little bigger than theirs. <laughs> They're seeing mm-hmm. these spinning wings going everywhere. And they've seen them, and every time they go down into them, they're getting shot at, which I'm you know, like every bird edu- gets educated eventually, right? But yeah. I'm just saying I feel like it with the way it's so tight, it might make it worse because they're seeing so many in one pass versus maybe if we're spread out a little bit more, they see them, and that's the only one they're looking at in that section, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I, I think I – think- with spinning wings and really everything you use for hunting, you you should really just try to be different than the people that are hunting nearby. Uh, I mean, you know, mm-hmm. change up your decoy spread, use more or use less, and make don't always make the same pattern on your spread. And you know, and then you know, it, the same with the calls. I mean, there's 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 a time where it seemed like every single guy in Arkansas blew a a timber uh, echo duck call. You know, and it's like every single duck sound like every single hunter sound like the same thing, you know, and mm-hmm. it's it's just, you know, if you got so much monotony and then you can give them something different, you know, if, if everybody's using one spinner or two spinners, why don't you get five? Try that out, right. you know, right. I mean, that kind of thing. Be different. And so, right. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So I was looking up some numbers because – I I guess I was wrong on what I assumed. I thought I heard it somewhere, but in 2016, so this is old. I guess I was trying to figure out who had the most active duck hunters, and I for sure thought it was Arkansas. And I thought California was like a second, but it's saying Texas. And then it's saying Arkansas is four, and then California is six. Okay. Do you disagree with that? Uh, I mean, <laughs> I, could pull, I could pull the numbers because I've got all that data. I just haven't looked at that particular – um, this was on real line. trees site, so I don't know if they, pulled, yeah, I, I've know. got, I actually pulled all of the numbers from, uh, 1999 to this past duck season and I printed them off and my wife got mad at me cause I printed off so much paper, <laughs> but <laughs> it's, it's literally got every state and every province of Canada and what their harvest data was for those years, how many hunters, how many hunter days were estimated in the field, how many, you know, all, everything you could pretty much want to know. I mean, there's things I still want to know that they didn't track for, but, um, that stuff is super interesting to me. So it wouldn't take me but a second to look that number up. I don't, um, I don't have it right here in front of me, but, but, you know, I, I think that, that typically, I mean, the, as far as the, I don't know about the hunter numbers themselves, but, but the, the, the harvest numbers, Uh um, have been at least for the last, I don't know, eight or nine years, probably Arkansas and California and Louisiana are the top three States pretty much always, Uh um, as far as the harvest. That might be Um, what it was. That might be what I'm thinking of, not the numbers, duck hunters. Yeah. The, 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 uh, uh, Arkansas was the number one harvest state this this past duck season. Uh, California is is in the top spot more often than not. Um, you know they they a lot of times would trade back and forth between Louisiana and them, but Louisiana has kind of fallen out of it in the last few years. I mean they they just don't get the numbers of ducks to to migrate through anymore, and that's something that concerns me because they got to come through me to get to them. You know in Arkansas. Mm-hmm. And, and so they, their numbers have gone from 
uh, I don't even remember, but they, it's like they're like 10 percent of what they were 20 years ago. Hmm. That's crazy, isn't it? Right. Yeah. And and we we still shoot the same percentage of ducks of of the overall harvest of both the United States and of the uh, Mississippi Flyway in Arkansas. We still shoot the same. Uh, California is pretty close to what they've always shot as far as percentage. You know, it always changes every year because of the of the population. You know, it may be you know you you may shoot a million ducks this year and next year you might shoot 800,000, but you still shoot in the same percentage of the overall harvest. And that's the, that's the important data to understand. Mm -hmm. And so we, we still shoot the same thing we always do, but, but, um, Louisiana is not, I mean, it's, it's like so far fallen off and, and Mississippi is, is, is struggling a little bit. Um, Texas is struggling a little bit They're They're still kind of holding their own, but it's, it's off, especially with their goose numbers. Mm. Yeah, that, and it's funny because he might kill me for saying this, but like Matt, I just got back from hunting with him in Nebraska, and it's like, man, there's no pressure there, huh? Don't you agree? I mean, I know it was early till season, but yeah. if you start mm-hmm. looking at the numbers of hunters, that's why yeah. we have we have almost four times as many duck hunters as they do. It says right here twelve thousand three hundred. Like I said, this was two thousand sixteen. Now they mm-hmm. have the birds, but if you don't have the hunters, I mean, obviously you're not gonna have the bird numbers. So, you know, you, Matt's you like, look, Matt, Matt's all don't, yeah. you know, keep this a hidden gem, you know. Oh yeah, no, I mean, it, the Central Flyway, um, most of those states just don't have hardly any pressure, and you, you know, you look at, you look at the harvest data, and I mean, you know, it's just they don't shoot hardly any ducks, but they still have great hunting. It's you know, the 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 perception of guys that know about it either mm-hmm. that live there or that travel there to hunt like you know like nebraska and kansas and oklahoma they, mm-hmm. they all have really really good hunting and they think that oh man that we shoot more ducks here than any other state uh, arkansas shoots more mallards than all of the other um central flyway states put together just about i mean mm-hmm. you know it's mm-hmm. just not there's just not that many birds getting killed there because there's not that many hunters doesn't doesn't take anything away from the fact that they um you know that they have great hunting it's great right. hunting and and they should count their blessings right. <laughs> you right. know that that it's not you know that that, that the um you know it's not too overcrowded but I, i'll tell you I, I hunted with uh with elliot over in kansas last mm-hmm. year and man it, it was i mean it was like a zoo there was a lot of people really <laughs> yeah wow <laughs> at least the first day it wasn't so bad i think after the first day but was that yeah, opener I mean, it was yeah it was yeah. opener. yeah yeah that's probably part of it too but mm-hmm. but too you've been hunting private for so long it might feel even worse to you whereas a guy like me coming out there hunting opener versus my opener I would probably think, oh, there's nobody here. This is awesome. It's all perception because, you know, I've been out there and I've heard them say, oh, that's busy. And I'm thinking, are you kidding me? Like, this is busy? Because in my mind, I'm thinking, if there's dudes not 100 yards away from me on all four sides, I'm like, it's not even busy, you know? Wow. So it's yeah. just all this perception. I guess, uh, you know, and, and that's something that we, that I, I get into discussions with guys. I mean, I haven't hunted regularly in, in public since about 2001. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I hunt a little here and there I and mean, it's probably been about eight or nine years, even uh, about six or seven years since I've even stepped foot on, on public hunting area. But, uh, it, I, and the reason why I quit is because it got so ridiculous mm-hmm. and it was, it was just like what you described in like 98 and 99 and 2000, it was like you go in there and guys would set up like 80 yards from you and they'd shoot over your decoys and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. I mean, like, you know, you would shoot a duck and it would, it would fall into your decoys and it would still be crippled. And then those guys would like start shooting at it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you're going to, you're going to hit somebody there, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and that, and, and so this is not this, this stuff that of crowded, you know, management areas, public areas and stuff. I mean, it's not new at all. And in fact, if you think about it, I, I don't, it's hard for me to, to, to see how it could be worse than it was 20 years ago because 20 years ago we had more hunters. Yeah, true. Yeah. And maybe it's not, you know, 
It might not be. It, it's perception, like you say, because, I mean, I know so many guys that we all used to hunt together in, in public woods, and now we all hunt private. <laughs> yeah. and, so, and so it's like maybe all the younger guys that don't, you know, they're the ones that don't have the perspective of what it was, you know, a long time ago. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. How do you think that YouTube has changed duck hunting? As far, mm. as far as how's how's it influenced like the youth? Do you think that it's made them want to do it more? Has it changed the way that they hunt? How do you feel about that? Yeah, I think that it definitely has introduced a lot of new people to to duck hunting, um, and I think that's that's great. Um, you know, I look through a lot of the Facebook groups where people, you know, are asking questions and stuff. And there's so many people on there that are asking questions about duck hunting. And they're like, I've never duck hunted before. I'm going to start duck hunting this year and I don't have anybody to help me. Mm -hmm. What do I do? I'm like, really? <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, that's, that kind of thing is foreign to me, but, but that's, that's what's happening. And, and, and there's, a, I think YouTube is, 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 uh, creating some of that. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I no. just, that's just the reality there's and, and what I'm seeing, you know, we get, we get a lot of that coming on guided hunts too. It's like somebody, um, you know, most of our locals is that, you know, guys that come that are within three or four hour drive They're they're probably guys that don't hunt much and they want They're trying to figure it out and they want to have a good experience. But, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of 30 something year old guys that never hunted and they have a kid now and their kid is starting to get close to the age of hunting and they want to get out and know what they're doing before their kid's old enough to, to start hunting. Or maybe they've got a, a young teenage son, like 13 or 14 year old. And, and they just, their, their kids like, I want to go hunting. I want to go duck yeah. hunting. And so they, they, so we're seeing that we're seeing a lot of questions from those. And of course, then there's the, 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 you know, the 18 to 22 year olds that are learning how to hunt and figuring it out. So I, I think that, that it's definitely brought awareness. I mean, there's a lot of people that blame, uh, you know, duck dynasty on some of that. And I, and I, you know, I don't think that any of that's been a negative deal at all. I think the the reality is, is that, um, we do have a lot of young guns out there that, that have not been brought up in hunting. They, they have not been taught because their dad or their grandfather doesn't hunt or he doesn't, he never took them. And they're figuring out on their own and they're watching YouTube. And so it is, it makes it so important for guys like us that have YouTube channels to make sure we portray hunting in the best light that we possibly can. Yes. It's not all about killing. It's about, you know, it's about the experience and it's about being able to enjoy, you know, the, the creation and enjoy your friends, but, you know, being respectful of, of the land and, and all the critters that are out there and, yeah. and, I mean, we can talk about all that stuff for a long time, but I think that, you know, my opinion is that we, we have to, um, I think we have to give guys a break a little bit that haven't been taught and hope that we can reach out to them in some way to, you know, help them to be better at, at hunting so that, you know, we don't have all the struggles that we do. I mean, I, you know, I, I put a video out several months ago and I kind of talked a little bit about that and it was kind of like a mixed reviews deal, deal because you had the, the, some of the older guys were like, you don't need to tell people how to do stuff. You don't need to be teaching people things. You don't, you know, mm -hmm. these are a bunch of guys don't need to, you know, they should need to figure it out on their own. They need to work hard and figure it out on their own. And, and, you know, that's a 40 year old guy saying that, that probably was taught by his dad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and and there's a difference between knowing some of the fundamentals and knowing some of the traditions and the way you do things and then go out and figure it out on your own. Yeah. I mean, you know, compared to I don't know how to do anything. I don't mm -hmm. even know what kind of choke I'm supposed to get for my gun and how many decoys do I need to get and all that kind of stuff. I mean, those guys are like completely clueless. And, and again, I don't mean that in a negative way, but that's just a reality. And mm -hmm. and and they they have got to get a mentor. That's the bottom line. Yeah. And two, I think it's great that they are getting involved because, you know, those type of people are going to attend event, different events and, and contribute to conservation over time. You know, as, mm -hmm. their, as their love and interest grows for the sport, they're going to become yeah. more involved. They'll, they'll mature over time. You know, um, if they don't have a mentor or if somebody does mentor them, they'll mature and, and they're going to be great contributors to the sport in the future. And we need, we need everybody that we can, to contribute, you know, so that we can preserve duck hunting for, for generations to come. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Indeed. So 
Um, I've we've kept you long enough, Joel. But somebody's on here that I think <laughs> you need to speak with on the Mountain Dew. Thomas has joined us for the fine out finale of this podcast episode. <laughs> we got another one here in just a minute with somebody else, another guest. So let's uh, who who likes Mountain Dew more? Is does he get to like it more because he's older than you, there, Thomas? <laughs> Maybe he can appreciate it more. How's it going, Joel? <laughs> I'm doing good, my brother. Yeah, I saw that uh, that video, Titus. You sent Titus. That was pretty funny. Yeah, I, we are we are blood brothers. I I can tell you that <laughs> we think a lot alike when it comes to Mountain Dew. I did. I matter of fact, I did buy some of those uh, Mountain Dew bottles in in uh, those glass bottles. I don't know who carried them out there, but Target had them out here. I don't know how. I saw them. I, I really don't buy soda in a store in a grocery store very very much. It's usually mm-hmm. just like a gas station or whatever, something like that. But I was walking through and and like something caught the corner of my eyes. Like <laughs> that's Mountain Dew in a bottle, glass bottle. You know, I was checking to make sure that I was sane. But I I bought those. Yeah, but I got to be honest with you. My favorite is a Mountain Dew out of a can, out of an ice chest. That is mine. Oh. That's mine. That's my weakness oh, right there. Oh no. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that's like that's like blasphemy. Oh, oh, hey, no. you know what? It, well, here was what's the funny deal in that video. So Travis is every bit as bad as Thomas. Like Travis, but Travis is older, so Travis is trying to wean himself a little yeah, bit. I'm trying to wean. It's hard. It's the nectar of the gods, you know. So it's, it's yeah. empty. Travis, <laughs> Travis is definitely an uh, addict, but. I told them, I go, I ha- I got a confession to make to you guys because, you know, I didn't bring Mountain Dews. I, I, I bring Mountain Dews now at the end of the hunt. If we have a good hunt, we'll all just crack one open. But yeah. I said, you don't even know how bad. Thomas don't know this because he's almost 10 years younger than me. <clears throat> but when I was 15, I worked at a Albertsons. I was a bagger there, and I would do it after school. And I had a major problem. <laughs> I literally would probably drink three or four Mountain Dews in the, I had a five to ten shift, and I would probably drink three or four of them every single shift. And I was working mm-hmm. thirty five hours, forty hours during the school week because I'd work mm-hmm. on weekends too. And uh, I probably did that for like a year. I mean, I I actually kind of forgot about myself. I was telling Thomas and Travis the other day, and all of a sudden, like a year into it, somebody that worked there was watching me get another one out of the vending machine. And they, you know what they did? They scared me half to death. I was 15 year old, turned 16. They said, and I bet you can guess what they scared me with. They said, "You know that has yellow five in it, right?" Yeah. yeah and they're like, "You know what that does to you, right?" It's a myth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "I have, I have two, two kids, kids to prove yeah. it." <laughs> so I, I have three to prove it. <laughs> have you been drinking it that much, like ever since you were young? You know, I don't know really when the addiction started, because um, I call it an addiction. I think it was when I was in hygiene school, and um, I started liking them then, but it got really bad when I it was a hygienist because I would be on my way to work, and there was a Chevron about 200 yards from where I worked, and so for some reason, my car would just veer in there in the morning and I, 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 on its own, and I would walk <laughs> in there, and like a zombie, I'd grab one, and you know, and so I'd drink that one down, and then about lunchtime, it's like, you know, hey, I need another Mountain Dew to make it through the rest of the day, and I'd grab one then. And then sometimes on the way home, you know, just to keep me awake on the way home, I grab one and then I'd get home and drink about two cans of, of Pepsi. So for a while, I was really, really bad. Um, the only time I really stopped the addictions when kidney stones hit a couple uh-huh. times. Mm-hmm. I thought they were related yeah. to Mountain Dew, so I'd cut off for about a couple months and then I'd get back on them. But man, I, I watch these YouTube videos and I, <clears throat> I like watching them, but I don't like seeing myself in them because I'm like, I look like that. <laughs> so I've been trying to wean myself off of them. Um, you know, we had a celeb- celebratory one the other day because my mm-hmm. son had come home from guiding in Alaska, yep. so I had yeah. to, you know, to celebrate that with a Mountain Dew. But mm-hmm. yeah, I'm mm-hmm. trying. I'm trying to cut back, you know, but it's hard. I I I never got into it where it was problem, you know, where I drank too many of them. I mean, <laughs> I, when I was younger, I would drink maybe one a day, kind of thing. And probably about ten years ago, I went. You know what? I, this is not good for me to drink that much sugar carbonated drink. So I, I probably have like one a week, uh-huh. you know, I might have them a little bit more often than that during duck season, but I just, it's like, 
I, I pick my poison and, <laughs> and if I'm going to have a, a carbonated soft drink or whatever, that's going to be my choice. And I'm just not yeah. going to have it that often, but, yeah. but yeah, it's, it's, I just love it though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, treasure every gulp of that stuff <laughs> well thanks for coming on here do you want to let uh again kind of let everybody know where they can find you on all your social medias and everything like that yeah so surviving duck season is a youtube channel i've got uh, a website surviving duck com. you can find us on facebook and on instagram uh at surviving duck season and uh, my personal is mr producer sir Awesome, and he, he, he puts out some really cool music vi- videos too for hunting and stuff like that. So, guys, check him out. Thanks for listening, and thanks for being here, Joel, today on this show. We'll see you guys next time.